that day after school, I went to the school library and looked up Thomas Merton. They had one book, The Sign of Jonas, which is the journal he kept at the monastery. And I opened it up in the first entry in the journal. He says, as for me, I have but one desire, the desire for solitude, to disappear into the secret of God's face. And I can remember 14 years old, I, I don't know what this means, but something in me does know what it means. And that's what I want. Because I had read Seven Story Mountain and Sign of Jonas and I just had a very basic sense of who he was, the significance of him, uh, that because of my trauma at home, I had issues with authority figures. And so I was very nervous talking to him, like my voice would shake and I had a hard time. I was 18. And uh, so he asked me what was going on. I, my voice was shaking. I said, because you're Thomas Merton. And, um, I worked at the pig farm, and he said, every day after work, I want you to come in here before Vespers and talk to me about what happened at the pig farm that day. And so I would go in and sit down, and we would talk about the pigs. And he'd remember all this stuff, we would talk about them. And it was a very freeing experience for me, kind of leveled the playing field, kind of opened me up to relax with him. And um, I never forgot that in terms of compassion the spirituality of compassion. And you'd sit down and typically he'd start out, be very casual, like, how's it going? And it, it was up to me to bring up whatever I wanted to talk about, of substance, about God's presence in my life, my struggles, and so on. And, um, and then he would engage me in dialogue about that. And what I picked up from him, it was a combination of being extremely uh, open and accepting to everything I said and asking uh, questions uh, that required me in answering him to listen more deeply to myself. And uh, the dialogue right away would take that tone, would take that tone. And that's what it was like. I just felt I would come out at the end of each session feeling clearer or more grounded and um, more aware of what the hindrances were and how to work with them. And that's what it was for me. I think what it was in a way was um, this, in his presence, I was freed up enough to be myself and especially to be myself in the sincerity in which I was seeking God. And in that sincerity with him of my desire for God, there was a certain kind of mutuality in it. And then I saw him as mentoring me in that. Because he introduced me to the, to the mystics, John of the Cross, and, and uh, he was starting to be a hermit at the time. And I got permission then to spend some time each day in an abandoned sheep barn. And uh, so the whole thing about contemplation and solitude and I just saw him as the living presence of the mystical tradition of the Christian faith. And we kind of, we were together in that context. A mystic is someone who has been uh, transformed in a mystical experience, such that they came out of that experience mystically experiencing everything that they experienced. That is, there's a moment of mystical experience and then it becomes habituated as an habitual state of consciousness. And I would say that mystical state of consciousness is a state of consciousness uh, in which we and God mutually disappear as dualistically other than each other. And so it's, it's a unitive state of consciousness of, uh, say, the divinity of myself, others, and all things. And then I saw the contemplative way of life as a way of life in which one's healed from all that hinders you from coming to that experience. So it's a life of silence, it's a life of surrender, it's a life of compassion, it's a life of trust, it's a life of faith, it's a life of uh, the, these transformative attitudes. And out of fidelity to those attitudes, 
it, that path gravitates toward this kind of habitual state of unity of consciousness. That's my understanding of it.